parched places. You shall be like a watered garden whose spring never fails. With thanksgiving, let us join together in the call to worship. Please stand. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Let us pray. Holy One, we bless you with all that is within us as we remember the blessings you have poured out upon us. Open our hearts and our minds to your spirit that is present with us. May it call us to hear what we need to hear so that we may become who we need to be, helping those most in need so that your kingdom on this earth may be restored. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us continue our worship with hymn number 482, Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty. Sisters and brothers, we all turn away from God 
losing sight of the hope standing before us. Yet still, when we confess our sins to God, we turn to God and the slate is wiped clean. So let us now turn to God and confess our sins using the printed prayer. With Christ as our hope, O oh God, we stand at the gates of your sanctuary seeking pardon. We confess that we have not worshipped you alone. Life makes its demands, and we push you to the margins. Forgive our small minds and mistaken priorities. Hear our secret sins that we confess now in silence. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, our hope reigns. And in Jesus Christ, each one of us is forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. seated. Grace and peace to you and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's a great joy to be gathered by God's grace not only here but also in homes and in hospitals around the central part of Alabama by way of television broadcast. We are glad that you are here. And if you read the front page of the Tuscaloosa News yesterday, some of us returned from Africa. And we are thankful uh, to be back. I greeted some of you at the early service last time, but all the saints in uh, Tumatuma, north of Nairobi, Kenya, send their greetings to you. They love this church. Many of them have been here in February, and they know us, and we know them, and they were very gracious to us, and not even a little old burning fire in Nairobi that wiped out the airport could stop what the Lord was doing, and we're thankful and glad to be back. You'll be hearing more about that time in the weeks ahead. Please let us know that you're here, signing the attendance pads and pass those down that we have a record of your attendance. Indicate if there are ways that we can be of service, especially if you're looking for a church home. Our session will meet next Sunday to receive new members. We'd love to talk to you about the simple ways of being a part of the life of this church. Also, you'll see from the uh, uh, congregational information, I'll be leading an inquirer's class beginning on September the 8th. Many of our college students may want to do that as well. It's a great way to know more about uh, not only our tradition, but other traditions and some of the things that are different and some that are very similar. It's during the Sunday school hour, beginning the 8th of September for four weeks in a row. Speaking of students, we welcome our many uh, University of Alabama Shelton students who are back or here for the first time. We're grateful for uh, your presence and a little later in the greeting time, if you hug some of the students around and they, a little lake water squeezes out, that's because they were at the lake outing yesterday and uh, drank a little bit of the lake water at the end of a, a tow rope and a, an, an inner tube. So uh, we're glad that they're here. Last week at the beginning of the year uh, at the campus ministry site, we had a great group again yesterday. And tomorrow is Pastor Student Day. That's when pastors from different places in the state come and uh, have a meal together and uh, celebrate their students being uh, connected with uh, West Ukirk, our campus ministry. You'll see a, a brochure that many of the students got as they came in. If not, there's some at each doors. 5.30 tomorrow evening. If you do not have a pastor, a pastor will be provided for you. 
We'll take you all out to dinner and it'll be wonderful. Now, I won't do this often, but I'd like for all of you who are university students to stand up now so we can say hello to you. Looky there, bunch of y'all. Hey, welcome. In the choir too, you see that? Great. Thank you. We're glad you're here, so glad. We won't do that again, so don't worry. But uh, please let uh, folks around you know where you're from and what's going on in your life, but it is wonderful. You'll see also on this card when you get it, it shows where the student center is. It's a half a block from where God lives, <laughs> from Bryant-Denny Stadium. So it has a good way to find it right there. Um, You'll see a number of other announcements in your bulletin about a young adult fall uh, social that's happening on Saturday at the uh, um, Christy and Scott Taylor's home, watch something called a football game at the same time. And uh, also we're putting on our calendar, our churchwide picnic in, uh, on October the 6th. One thing that did not make the bulletin, but obviously is a part of us as a people of the, this community is to vote on Tuesday. It's a good opportunity uh, to vote. John Calvin, the father of our tradition, said the highest calling is not to be a pastor of a church, but is to be a civil servant, acting out the kingdom of God among the people of God. We have a minute for mission now. Cal Holt will come and speak to us. He's a, an elder in the church, uh, 35 years taught the senior high. We don't want to go there. Teacher of the senior high Sunday school class. He's also chair of the Counseling Ministry Professionals Board and has something to tell us. Cal. I started teaching Sunday school when I was 12. <laughs> I, got to, I got to give this pitch at early church this morning. They let me stand in the pulpit for that. I don't know what I said, but obviously I got demoted. Um, I tell you what, that early church is a pretty good gig. It's about 15 minutes shorter than this one. Uh, Charlie doesn't preach as much and the prayers are a lot shorter. You might want to consider that sometime. Um, teach you mess with me. Okay. You know, our church has a rich history of being involved with mission work throughout the world and the community. Uh, we've also been the beginning of outreach in a number of ways in our community. The soup bowl being one, caring days being another, and one you may not be as familiar with is counseling ministry professionals. This ministry is about five years old. It was started by a joint effort of this church with Charlie Durham, First Methodist Church, and Christ Episcopal Church. Dr. Margaret Scalisi, as well as Sam Collier, are our clinicians. It's a very vibrant and thriving counseling ministry right now. But we need your help and your support. We're having a, a fundraiser that is a dinner. A dinner on September the 5th at 6 o'clock here at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, we will have a little entertainment from Todd and Amy Prickett, but also have a chance to thank Charlie and the other two ministers for their insight to what we need in this community and help in many ways. The tickets are $75 a piece. That money goes to our, <clears throat> excuse me, our Helping Hands Fund, which helps pay for uh, services that those that cannot pay those for those services. If you look in your bulletin, there's a green sheet that defines what we're doing, what this is all about, ways that you can give, I will tell you that the way we set this up is we would have an equal number of tickets for each of the three churches, Episcopal, Methodist, and First Presbyterian. Folks, we're running behind. We haven't sold as many as the other two churches. So unless you want me to call you on the phone and beg you to buy a ticket, please go ahead and do with that in the way that the, the, the green sheet says, or you can see Susan or, or in the, in the church office. But please come and help us celebrate the counseling ministry professionals. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite all of the children forward for the word to the children.
Good morning. It's so good to see you all here this morning. And I see many of you brought your backpacks with you today. And I believe that's because you have just finished a big first week of school. How many of you raise your hand if you had an awesome first week of school? All right, that's an honest answer. Raise your hand for some of you if starting school was a little bit scary this week. A little bit scary. I always got a little scared my first week of school. And you know what? All of us out here, even the university students who started school this week too, we remember what that's like about how sometimes we go to school and we're nervous and things are new, and we have new friends and new teachers in our class. And so I wanted to give something to each of you today that you can put in your school bag when you go to school. So why don't you, everybody, take one of these and pass them to everybody else. Make sure everybody gets one. What this is, is it's a blessing for you to keep in your bag, and it has a prayer on it that you can say on your way to school every day. The prayer says, Loving God, be with me today when I go to school. Help me to learn from my teachers every day. You gave us the gift of learning. Help me to remember to show my thanks by showing kindness to everyone I meet. And on the back, these are questions that you can talk with your mom and dad and friends about, about the blessings you receive at school, and how you can be a blessing to someone else, and who you can pray for in your class and at your school. So this is a reminder that God is not just here at our church. God goes with you to school every day, and the prayers of all these people help watch over you at school every day. So right now, I want to say a blessing for all of you and for all of the teachers and administrators and other school helpers that we have in our congregation today. So let's pray. Loving God, thank you so much for the children of our church. Bless them in this new year that they would live out your call to share the love of Christ with all the friends they encounter. Bless the parents who place these backpacks upon their backs, the teachers who fill them with opportunities to learn and grow, administrators who work tirelessly to see the year through, cafeteria workers, custodians, and support staff who make life better for our children. For a new year, for new life, and for new ways of understanding you, we pray. And all God's children say, Amen. Now, y'all can go follow Miss Reverend Luann to Children's Church. And if you would like to take one for a friend or to share, you can have an extra. There you go. You want to share? Please join me in prayer. Lord, you call each and every one of us to be your people. And we may not know what that looks like, but still your call is true. So silence in us any voice but your own and illumine us so that we may understand how you are calling us through your word this day. Amen. For the Old Testament lesson, we go to 
the prophet Jeremiah, the first chapter, verses 4 to 10, as we read of the call of young Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, My Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Here ends the first reading. We turn next to the letter to the Hebrews, and as we do, we need to think of Hebrews as a travelogue. And the way most travelogues work today, the travel agent will try to get you to imagine where you're going on the trip. And then you go these places in your mind long before you buy the ticket. And so in this passage, we find that There are two destinations. The first one is Mount Sinai. It's the place where Moses received the law, the Old Covenant. The second image is of Mount Zion, where Jerusalem sits and where Jesus lives. So, in order to help us along with this travelogue, we need some marching music. And as Jeff plays a little, we're marching to Zion, let us hear God's word for us today, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 18. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only earth, but also the heaven. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, 
Our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. He was a good friend of mine. I never understood a word he said, but I helped him drink his wine. And it was mighty fine wine, singing joy to the world, all the boys and girls, joy to the fishes and the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. Now, Three Dog Night may have sung about that, but they were not singing about the biblical prophet Jeremiah. There was no joy in Jeremiah, none whatsoever. In fact, in this, the longest book of the entire Bible, there is no joy. Hope, yes, just when it was needed, but not joy. Rabbi Joseph Tulshkin calls the prophet Jeremiah the loneliest man in the Hebrew Bible. Eli Weissel remarks of Jeremiah, there was no, lo no joy in his life ever, no pleasant surprises, no warmth, no smiles, nothing but sorrow and anguish and tears. Words of woe and anger. Words he was made to speak against his will. He wanted to speak of other things. He wanted to be a normal person. But he had, he had no choice. He had no choice. Nothing causes the fur on the back of our necks to stand up more than even the suggestion that our freedoms would be limited. Especially as Americans, we fought and died for the freedom to choose. But when it gets right down to it, there are times when we have no choice. It started for me in the dinner table in my home, eat your vegetables or you can't leave the table. There wasn't any of this bribing of, well, if you eat half the vegetables, you can have half a scoop of ice cream. No, it was, you eat your vegetables or you will be here in the morning and you will start with your vegetables for breakfast. You will go to school today, no choice. It spilled over to Sunday school and church. We didn't even dare to ask that one, no choice. Our older daughter found out that even though I did not like the way my parents parented me all the time, I learned that skill. One day, as a high school student, she said, Dad, I've got a, a babysitting job this Sunday afternoon. I said, well, good. Um, where is it? Where are you going to be? And I'll pick you up in time for youth fellowship. She said, Dad, Dad, it's all evening. It's, it's during the time of youth fellowship. I said, then you made a mistake. You need to call that family back and tell them you will not be there at that time because you have a commitment to our youth fellowship and I will be taking you there. No choice. You know, since the boomer generation, ours is about ready to skid into oblivion with retirement, for me it is when? December 2014. Okay, just want to know if you're listening. Um, we are challenging our best and our brightest young people to consider a calling to ministry. During the time I've been privileged to serve this congregation, seven have entered the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. They wear robes, pulpit robes, given by this church affirming our connection with them wherever they are, whether it's in St. Simon's Island or Philadelphia, whether it's in Arkansas, whether it's in, uh, now in Livingston, Alabama, or in Sylacaugo, wherever. You see, some tried to respond as Jeremiah did. I'm only a youth, I'm a teenager, and hey, I flunked speech class. But Jeremiah has been saying, as Wiesel suggests, I want to remain a child. I want to stay a teenager forever. It's what I like to call Peter Pan theology, wanting never to grow up. A few years ago, Robert Bly wrote a book entitled The Sibling Society, in which he argued that many of our social ills today can be traced back to the fact that so many just don't want to grow up, to take on real responsibilities. Uh, they might want to be like an older sibling, 
but they don't want to take on responsibilities or authority or leadership. The greatest, the greatest generation, many of whom are sitting with us today, are uh, slowly and quickly and persistently aging and soon will not be with us. As a church, we are rapidly approaching the time we're going to not be able to look to them anymore, and we have to look to our younger generations, born since World War II, the boomers, the Gen Xers, the Gen Yers, the millennials, and whatever else we're called these days. But you know, we younger generation believe in having a good life instantly. We haven't really learned from the greatest generation what it is to sacrifice for a greater good and a greater cause. We think that because we've received so much from our parents graciously, that we're to expect that um, instantly, right away. We want it all now, but we refuse to grow up and to take on our responsibility and our responsible place of giving to others. So churches have turned to marketing gimmicks to get people in their doors. I knew a church even years ago that every Sunday had each uh, pew seat marked with a number. And during the service, they would draw a number or two, and whoever sitting in that seat would win color TVs. <laughs> Don't wait for that here. <laughs> uh, others have done other things. And, Young people today and young adults are constantly looking for what can this church do for me, what can that church do for me, rather than this generation that has tried to inspire us to ask, what can I do for my Lord in this time and in this place? You see, the Lord God who formed Jeremiah in his mother's womb, who knew him and consecrated him before he was born, this same God, will not hear any excuse of youth and won't let any be dropped off the prophetic hook. There was a young man in Montgomery, Alabama who tried to get off the hook, didn't want the calling that was being put upon him, and yet he stood at the Washington Monument and gave a vision to the nations of the world of what the Lord God wants for his people. And Martin Luther King, Jr. was faithful to that high call. He had no choice, no choice. No bribing with ice cream, reduction of sentence of vegetable, no watering down of the call. God claims us, God chooses us, and by the love of Christ, um, we follow as disciples. Saul found that out. He deserved nothing but death, and yet, on the Damascus Road, his life was turned completely. John Calvin, the father of our Presbyterian tradition, was just passing through Geneva until William Farrell said, unless you stay and help bring in the Reformation, the wrath of Almighty God will be upon your head. And he stayed. What could he do? He had no choice. When God calls, there is no choice but to say yes. This is the theological doctrine of the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign and calls, and we are to respond. The churches of Brazil are a great example. In Brazil, 50% of the population is under the age of 25. And the Presbyterian churches there have called young adults, even some teenagers, to be elders of that church. And because of that call in Christ, they have decided to live their life differently as an example for Jesus Christ. They preach and they teach the word. They make sacrificial gifts of time and money, even though they are only youth. This church is a great example, too. Parents take vows in presenting their child for baptism, and we take vows in return, as if we had a choice. They've been entrusted to our care and keeping. Our, our Logos Children's Ministry on Wednesday afternoons, the, the the planning team prays through the names of the church, and then they call you not just by telephone. It's a theological call that God has, has chosen you to serve in this particular way so that faith is not so much taught as it is caught. There are no volunteers in Logos. Everyone is called. It's a high calling. 
Parents also heed that call, bringing their children, supporting them, even if they whine at first, I don't like it. All my friends are not there. Tough. This is what it is to follow as a disciple of Jesus Christ. The Presbyteries in Alabama, North, South, and Shepherds and Lapsley, Shepherds and Lapsley ganged up on this church a few years ago. They sat us down and said, in the 40s, you began campus ministry at the University of Alabama. Then it formed its own church, and they've been doing campus ministry. They're getting smaller. It's time for you to take up the leadership of campus ministry. They said, if you don't do it, we'll give that money to Auburn. Well, <laughs> uh, there's no choice there. <laughs> and so we took on the challenge. And to this day, you, this church, are spending over $120,000 a year to support these incredible young adults who come here many of whom were being shaped and molded by campus ministry that is now called Ukirk. An example of that was a homecoming last week in Livingston, Alabama, of all places. It was for the ordination and installation of Reverend uh, Barrett Abernathy. Barrett came here as a graduate student uh, in history, stood at this door with his mother and father, and his parents said, he'll be here every Sunday. I said, <coughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> Barrett was here every Sunday. Uh, became a leader in Westminster Fellowship, and began hearing a sense of calling to ministry. And as a result, we hired him for a year to be an intern to work with campus ministry and with this church. He met and married his wife through campus ministry, and now has been ordained as the pastor of the Livingston Presbyterian Church right on the campus of the University of West Alabama, where he'll be doing campus ministry. Preaching the sermon was... Um, also, a person from this church, Reverend Ross Reddick, he too had come through our campus ministry. He too met his wife, and now he's the ordained pastor at the Sylagaga Church here in Alabama. Um, it was uh, also amazing to see sitting in the choir at that service some of our own choir members, including Marilyn Tucker, who was a part of our campus ministry and is now studying for the ministry at Columbia Theological Seminary. Pray for her. She has her ordination exams the rest of this week. And there, amidst all the ministerial finery with their robes and everything else, were uh, Audrey and Wade Smith, whose involvement in campus ministry predates uh, even these new pastors. Also, Sarah and Scott Kaler were there, uh, also celebrating their involvement in the past and continuing involvement and leadership in campus ministry. And then on Monday, I received an email from Thomas Parsons. Thomas started at the university 20 years ago. Uh, he met and married his wife, Ashley. I did their wedding down in uh, uh, Government Street Church in Mobile. And they became very active, got our church reinvolved in campus ministry at the time. When he finished his master's degree in aeronautical engineering, he took a job with Bell Helicopter in Fort Worth, Texas, and within two years was elected an elder in that church, the youngest elder ever elected in that staid, huge, downtown Texas church. Thomas was writing me to say, a young man from our church is coming to Tuscaloosa to the university. I want him to have the kind of experience I had in campus ministry. Take good care of him. Wow. How blessed we are, even when we have no choice. We didn't have a choice. We couldn't let Christ down, nor his church, nor our children. We can't backslide to Mount Sinai's domination by a religion of fear with sights and sounds and of horrors of the heat of the, into the, the doom and darkness where our salvation rests upon the decisions, the choices that we make, our willingness to follow the old covenant, all the laws, and be wonderfully good human beings instead. We are moved upward towards Mount Zion with its grace, its grace of forgiveness and of power, of joy and celebration, of a new covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus Christ and his burning, burning passion to save his people. Some ask, 
where do you want to go today? As if it was yours to choose. But the real question is, with whom will you travel? With whom will you travel? On the path marked Sinai, you travel on your own by yourself, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, on your own sagging strength without any grace. But if we hear the voice speaking to us, that voice that in these last days has spoken to us by a son, then we will follow Jesus. We will travel with Jesus to Mount Zion's joy. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. This passage ends. So, do we, do we sing the doxology or, or do we hide under the pews? The preacher wants that image of a consuming fire to stay right there in our imagination, undefined, mysterious, since God's fire both devours and refines. It both incinerates and it purifies. Who then, when confronted by the consuming fire of God's call, can do anything but? Well, we can search for excuses maybe, but anything but when we are touched by the hand of Christ, we are forever anointed by the call. There is no choice. Dr. Fred Craddock, retired professor of preaching, was addressing a convocation of new students coming to a seminary. No doubt many uh, first-year students uh, felt like they had no choices because they were already chosen for them, prerequisites we call them. Still others were wrestling if they really had a call to ministry or not, wondering uh, what they would do when they grow up. Dr. Craddock said it's very simple. You go into the ministry if you can't do anything else. Now, he didn't mean if you couldn't be a doctor or a business leader or a pilot or a soldier uh, or a nurse. No, I mean if you can't do anything else, that is your call to ministry. I believe our calling to teach Sunday school, to advise youth, to shepherd children, to visit the sick, to befriend the lonely, to clothe the naked, to encourage the downtrodden, to provide counselors in a community where people are struggling, to take the gospel to the world, to take it to our neighborhoods, to present our children to the Lord and to uh, receive nurture, to give the gifts and talents the Lord has given to us back in response to provide support for students through campus ministry. There really is no choice. We can do nothing else. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Responding to God's word proclaimed, let us stand and affirm our faith using these words from the Declaration of Faith. Sisters and brothers in Christ, what do we believe? Informing his people and sending them into the world, Jesus called individuals to be disciples. They were to share the joy of his companionship, to understand and obey his teachings, and to follow him in life and death. We confess that Christians today are called to discipleship. Life shared with Christ and shaped by Christ is God's undeserved gift to each of us. It is also God's demand upon every one of us, never perfectly fulfilled by any of us. Forgiven by God, and supported by brothers and sisters, we strive to become more faithful and effective in our daily practice of the Christian life. Let us continue with hymn 485, To God Be the Glory.
Please be seated. I bring before you this day the concerns of our congregation and of this church. We lift up Lena Somerville, who will be having surgery tomorrow. We continue our prayers for Sigail Friedman, who remains in the hospital at Princeton uh, in Birmingham. Um, she is recovering, but she does request no visitors at this point in time. Uh, we pray for Dick West, who is currently in the ICU at UAB. We continue our prayers for Alicia Oric Brightwell, uh, who is Jennifer Smith's niece. She is in a hospital in New York. For Margaret Butler, who is in DCH, and Reverend Sam Nettles, who is currently at home. And our continued prayers for Rachel Williams, who is Ashley Mon's niece. Uh, she remains currently in Children's Hospital. And as you've heard this day, we continue our prayers for all of our students, all of our faculty, our staff, all of our children who are in school. Uh, you certainly have our prayers with you. Let us go to God in prayer. God who calls and God who leads, where can we flee from you? Where can we hide from your spirit? In the darkest of days, you are there, and in the brightest of rays, you are there. And when you call, we have no choice but to answer. Though we confess we don't always understand why you call, we don't know what we have to offer or what we can say or what we can do. Your call is a mystery, yet still you call. And at this particular moment and in all moments of our lives, you call us to pray for the world you created in love and for the people within it, for the soldier on the battlefield, for the widow weeping at home, for the parent dropping their child off at school, for the college student settling into their new life on campus, for our brothers and, sis and sisters stuck in hospital beds or at home, for Lena, Segale, Dick, Alicia, Margaret, Sam, and Rachel. Comfort us, God, your called people, that even in the best and the worst of times, we may place our hope and faith in the one who conquers crosses and empties tombs, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've been given many gifts by the Lord our God, so I now invite you to return a portion of those gifts this morning as we give of our tithes and our offerings.
pray with me? Lord of all who always has been and always will be, we rejoice in offering you these gifts and pray that our lives may show forth the blessings you have given to us. May we serve you with all that we have and all that we are, no matter how difficult, that we may shine Christ's love into the world. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Let us now close with hymn number 525, Here I Am, Lord.
the one who calls us, who sends his son to be the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, is also the one who gives us these words of benediction for our journey from the end of the letter of the Hebrews. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen.